And now it's my great privilege to introduce Professor Pre Peter Freebody, a colleague for at least seven years at the University of Sydney, and I know a colleague to many of you here today. Peter is an honorary professor at both the University of Wollongong and the University of Sydney. He has published in the areas of literacy education, educational disadvantage, classroom interaction, and educational research methods. More than that, he has made sure that he has worked with teachers to, to look at the implications of that research and translate it into the classroom. And I think that's a very important contribution to the teaching profession over the many years that he's been involved in educational research. He's a fellow of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia and a member of the Literacy Research Panel of the International Reading Association. More than that, a couple of weeks ago, he was made the chair of that ILA Literacy Research Panel. And this is the first time a non-Australian has both been a member of the panel and now the chair. And I think that is highly significant. Peter's received a number of awards over the years, including the 2014 W.S. Gray Citation for lifelong international contribution to research in literacy education. Can you welcome with me Professor Peter Freebody to speak to us this morning? Thank you. Uh, the lead item in my CV should say I'm retired. Peter Freebody is retired. My uh, family got together and did a moderation exercise and gave me a C- minus for retirement in the last <laughs> couple of years. There's a little note at the bottom that said probably will not do better. Okay. Uh, my uh, talk today is, uh, uh, is it the, the uh, head title there, of course, the rest of that is uh, Ignorance Killed the Cat, Curiosity Was Framed. I want to talk about uh, curiosity being... Um, uh, an essential element of uh, what we do, and we've talked a lot and it's come through the conference in a number of ways. But I also want to talk about um, things that I'm curious that get left out in a lot of the uh, standardized assessment programs that go on. I'm going to talk about those uh, a little bit to start with and what the implications of not knowing about those uh, might be uh, for people who are, in fact, the objects of, that, uh, of those programs, which in a sense is yourselves and what it means to, and I'm going to, basically one of the messages I hope is that if we're going to be engaging at least publicly uh, with the kinds of research programs that are intended to or taken to bear upon the work that we do, that you do, day in and day out, then it's important that there be some savvy in the profession about the nature of research rather than just dismissing these programs as being somehow irrelevant uh, to what you do or accepting them uh, and believing that they do, in fact, speak completely and comprehensively and validly to what you do. Any piece of research will say some things to you. The, per the point of research uh, overall is to give you, uh, to give us better explanations of what's going on, and it's those explanations that enable us then to adapt what the research might suggest, to take account of it, to weigh it up in terms of the circumstances in which you work, and to use it or not use it, in a sense. That is the nature of the profession's relationship to a body of research that speaks to it. And with regard to literacy, as I'll talk a bit about today, there's a lot of different kinds of research that is done around this topic, and I'm curious that so much of it is left out of the picture uh, that is presented to you. So I'm going to do a little bit of kind of, a um, little bit of research methods, things about ways in which these, these research programs can be evaluated, things we should know that many of you know already, or some of you will know already. I'm going to talk about other kinds of research that bears an, on, the, on the issue and things that, um, things that it might say to you about uh, different ways of looking at the nature of literacy education and performance. So it's a bit uh, uh, of a, a pastiche of a, of a talk, really looking at it over breakfast, but anyway. Um, to start with, no, okay, so does this work? Yes, it does. Um, I'm going to talk about different kinds of school uh, narratives, narratives, if you like, that are given to you by different disciplines and the way they approach educational research differently. I'm going to look about, initially I'm going to look at some things from the large-scale testing programs that 
have been done that you hear about, you read about in the, in the papers. I'm going to talk not so much about MAPLAN because surprisingly little analysis is done on it compared to the international studies. I'll talk about some lessons from that, some cautions, and some interesting curious items in there which might lead you to think or lead us to think in different ways about the nature of literacy education, how we explain it as a set of social practices and so on. I'm going to give you some less often told stories from linguistics, some sociology and a bit of critical social theory. You can see that this is going to be packed and fast. And I'm going to talk about what might be useful to you and suggest that there is research coming from other kinds of disciplines and other domains of education that has really very rarely been applied in, uh, in literacy education that I think should be. And I think it's a time to start thinking about those kinds of things. And I'll talk about that and I'll end up with uh, some stories from uh, the history of literacy which has got some powerful lessons for us and which speak directly to uh, what we see going on around us day to day in, uh, in public and in the ways in which the discourses of literacy education uh, pervade through, uh, through, the, through the community. And I'll show you a funny little letter right at the end. Okay. I've got three curious things that you don't see reported with regard to PISA and PIARC. PISA and PIARC, if you're not familiar with them, uh, is PISA is the International Student Assessment, and PIARC is the International Adult uh, uh, Assessment of Adult Competencies. It's a program of International Assessment of Adult Competencies. So I'm just going to refer to them as PIARC and PISA. PIARC is the R-rated version of PISA, okay? It's for the grown-ups only. They get to do all sorts of grown-up sorts of things. And it has some very interesting associations with it. As you know, with PISA, they ask kids if you do you like school, as well as assessing their literacy and numeracy and other things. So there's a few things that go on around that, right, are the social relationships within schools and so on, but relatively little compared to the work with the adults and the competencies there. There's much to critique in these sorts of work. And the, but, and the relevances need to be kept in mind, but we have to have the competencies and the understandings as a profession to know precisely how to critique them rather than to dismiss them, or at least before dismissing them. Let me show you the first curiosity here that strikes me. When you look at the results for PISA, 10 to 15 year old PISA, you will find this. Girls do better than boys in every single participating OECD country and partner country. Every single one. For the most part, statistically significant differences. There's a few that are different, but not sig statistically reliably different. And the gap's bigger in some countries than it is in other countries. So the girls do better on school literacy. You can look at the tests. We can wonder whether or not that has to do with the test material, or whether it has to do with something to do with schooling, or whether it has to do with something else. And as you know, there's a big literature uh, on boys every now and then, boys and literacy surfaces, right? Remember, we did it in the 80s, we're doing it again here and there, and we wonder about what is it about the Y chromosome that means you're going to have trouble with this stuff sort of thing. But when you go and look at the PIAC studies, you get a different story. It turns around absolutely, absolutely, every single country, males do better than females on the, on the literacy measures. Not statistically significant for the 16 to 22 year old age group, but a little better, the males, with the 16 year old males not still in school, these are the adults, but po powerfully different across the rest of the age levels. Which makes you wonder about the explanations you hear with regard to gender and literacy in terms of the girls' superiority through the school years. It makes you ask questions about, it makes you need a better explanation about how it is that this business of literacy is so powerfully gendered somehow or other within the school framework and similarly within the adult workplace framework but in the opposite direction somehow. That's a report, that's a result that's, that's very rarely reported but is very powerful. And you may wonder what kind of explanation you would have. Well, how, well, how would you analyze that? What comes to your mind first of all? Well, all sorts of explanations, one being that you know, one thing we know about the gender differences, the superiority females in school performance is that it is not mapped out in terms of professional success or salary in the years that follow school. Okay, it, isn't it, doesn't, it doesn't flow through in the same kinds of ways. But whatever that does, 
It's a curiosity that needs a better explanation than we currently have. It needs some explanation perhaps to do with the different kinds of pressures that come in, the different consequentialities that are involved in adult, in literacy in the adult workplaces, the things that matter differently in different kinds of workspaces, domestic and civil and, and uh, vocational sites. But it needs a better explanation than we have. Of course, two, but what I'm saying about two thirds of the, of the adults that cannot read and write pretty much at all in the world according to UNESCO are female. So about 520 million of the adults, of the adults who can't read and write are female. And as we know, some of the real heroes, we're talking about stars and rock stars and celebrities in literacy education, some of the real heroes currently in literacy education of the world, in the world are some of the girls and young women in some countries that are risking kidnapping, injury, and sometimes death by insisting on going to school and learning how to read and write. They're showing us how what, what this stuff really matters about. And they matter, it matters big time. Okay, number two is the issue of trust. Now, you would think if you statistically control for socioeconomic status and you statistically control, control for gender and workplace uh, environments that people work in and all of that kind of thing, and you look across the entire OECD thing, you find this, 24 countries, you compare the bottom 20% of people in terms of bottom scoring and the bottom 20% of their literacy scores with the top 40% and you find that the folks in the lower 20% literacy, controlling for poverty, controlling for first language, second language status and gender and so on, they are two and a half times more than twice as likely to indicate that they do not trust the people, communities and societies around them compared to the highest 40%. So statistically, at least, and OECD people are good at stats, just statistically, there's something about being in the world and trusting the world that has got something to do with literacy as best we can with these other factors teased out. Okay. So here, for all of the things we might criticize, uh, the PIAC studies, the assessment of adult literacy, the ad and you can look at the items, they're all up on the, on the website. You can look at the items and you can say, well, it's not just about some countries doing better than other countries. In fact, as the, both the PISA and the PIAC reports say all the way through, this also is left out, they say all the way through that the variation within any given country is greater than, vari than the variation between countries. So when you look at national comparisons, and oh dear, Australia got beaten by New Zealand of all places, they got beaten by New Zealand, <laughs> got beaten by somebody, whereas we beat them last year. Okay, so the whole enshrining of national identity as a unit of analysis, whereas the researchers are saying, you know what, the variation within the countries is bigger than any of the variations between them. They keep telling us that it's nations that fund these things, it's nations that want national comparison, so they report it in nations, and when they get the reports in terms of nations, that's what finds its way through to the media, right? That's what you do know, is that we slipped the grade or we did better this year, good for us, Team Australia, right? So, with significant Norbert Seven, in some countries it's way over significant, the lead non-trusting group being Australian. 2.8 times on average, statistically controlling for the other things, and you can see the other ones there as well. And finally, so what can we learn about that? We've got to theorise that. That's not just an accidental finding, that doesn't happen in every single country at that scale, somehow by accident, it's not a statistical fluctuation. How do we theorize that? There's something about literacy. It's not that Australians trust the public less, it's just that it correlated with literacy in this powerful way. That's the difference. It's not just that we trust less than the Danes or the Germans or whatever, that's not the statistic, okay? So there's something about your engagement with your world your connection with the flows around you that is affected by this, by this capability that you do or do not have or have more or less of in this way. And finally, agency. So they ask a question like, do you feel that you have any say in what goes on around you, nationally, locally, community, do you have any efficacy, do you have agency in these sorts of things? And people who are in the lowest of the literacy scale, the adults say, 2.5 times more likely to say they have no say in what government does and what goes on around them compared to the highest 40%. The middle group they leave out because the statistics aren't as dramatic when you put the everybody in, but they're dramatic in terms of these extreme group comparisons. And there's an awful lot of people we're talking about here. This is 26 
nations with very large numbers of practitioners. And again, they're statistically significant in most cases. Look at Germany, 4.5 times more. More likely to say no stay in government. High performing, highly democratic, long standing democratic nation with a phenomenal GDP per capita. The success story of Europe don't feel like they have any say. And so on. Australia's about on the average of two and a half. So these are curiosities, aren't they? They're kind of things that you don't find in the newspapers. Usually the, the, the what you find is the reports of national status, whether we did better or worse and so on, and the newspapers and the media and the politicians and, and the profession make different kinds of things about this sort of thing. But these are the real findings that I think are worth being curious about because they actually encourage us to get better explanations of what it is that goes on. Not just why it matters, but to actually think about have a, do you have a theory of what we do with language and literacy and English education that, ac that accommodates these sorts of ideas, that incorporates issues as big as this? So here's some things I think we should learn from that. Statistically, there are countries that are grouped together uh, that are different in the rankings but are not significantly different. If you look at the actual results listed, you find that the you're listed in terms of, you rank in terms of your actual scores, but in fact, whole clumps of countries are not statistically s reliably different from one another, particularly in the middle group. And many of the reported reports that go on about how whether this country is up or down or something, particularly in the middle groups from about the third or fourth ranked country down to about the 20th, are very, very large clusters of non-significantly different uh, things. So we may beat Poland one year technically, but not really statistically reliably so. It turns out that it's a much less dramatic story than the media can make of it. But that's their job, is to, they're, not, they're not paid to be undramatic. And they've got to try to make something of it, and the politicians have to try to do something with it. But the profession needs to know this. You need to know that we haven't actually been statistically significantly different from performance with regard to Poland and New Zealand and Canada for any of these administrations. The stats just don't say that. And the statistical reports in the reports themselves don't say that, but the translation into public does say that. We're assuming somehow that these tests have, diff have a particular relationship to curriculum. That's why PISA does what it does. These are school kids, right? They wake up in the morning worrying about reading and writing. Do they worry about the PISA type test reading and writing, generic tests of comprehension? No, they worry about the science report and the history assignment and stuff like that or whatever they're doing. Okay, so we're assuming and that's carried along with the assumption when you look at this kind of work, just as you look at the PIAC stuff and ask about does that speak to competencies that are involved in workplaces? Increasingly, it doesn't speak to what goes on 21st century workplaces. It's very much unimodal. It's very much print technology. It's very much moldable drawing type of stuff and things like that. So there are real limitations to it. But even so, there are challenges in thinking about how you get these sorts of things. And of course, the big issue is the relationship between correlations and cause. Something correlates and something causes it. If you recall, one a few years ago, the, uh, one of the ACR reports reported that the, there is a significant, statistically significant correlation between the amount of homework a kid does and their scores on the reading test. And there were reports and there were academics that reported that that means it's a good idea to get your kid to do more homework. So do more homework, it can go up. Now, of course, we think about literacy, where literacy people, so we think literacy is the cause here. Literacy is the thing we're trying to predict, what causes better literacy. If we were homework researchers, we'd be thinking, we'd be saying, being better at reading means you're going to do more homework. So with any correlation, no matter how statistically significant it is, there are at least four explanations. One is that reading, be better reading causes more homework. One is that more homework causes better reading. One is that they both sort of cause one another, they inform one another through, through time. And the other is that they're both, there's no causal relationship between them at all. They're caused by some other thing that you didn't measure. They are both caused by some other thing, like, for example, pedagogic parents, engaged parents, helicopter parents, whatever the term might be. There are parents that are monitoring and they're helping, and they're helping with reading, and they have done maybe before the kid went to school. And that causes and the appearance of a relationship which we mistake for cause. So there were articles in academic journals advising parents to make sure their kids did more homework and advising teachers to give more homework. And that is statistically illiterate. That means the research that may have been done in good faith and carefully is translated to use 
in ways that relies upon the fact that you don't know any of this stuff. You don't have any statistical savvy or any methodological savvy that tells you the correlation is not cause. It might be. If it does cause, one does cause the other, then it will be correlated, but it doesn't clinch that by any means. And the other, of course, is that literacy, in the role that literacy plays through history and in the cultures of Finland is comparable to the role that it plays in through the history in cultures of Singapore or of Poland or of Greece. And of course it doesn't, that these, these issues, these school systems, the Singaporeans who I worked for a couple of years will talk about the fact that we're moving out of survival education, an education system that just allows our country to survive, which became an independent country with very little money in 1965. This is their 50th anniversary, 50SD, which is a big sign for the way that Singapore is made, where I was two weeks ago. And that plays a completely different part in that country's development, okay? But comparing countries just like their football teams assumes that there's all these level playing fields. So there's an additional conceptual savvy that we need to have when we look at these things. It does not mean we dismiss them. There is still interesting curiosities that arise that force us to try to think about better kinds of explanations. Enshrining the nation state. One of the things that PISA does very nicely and PIAC does as well is to say, you know, if you forget what country you're in, if you actually take seriously that the real variations that matter are within these countries, you can find things like across the entire OECD and all of the partner countries, there is a powerful socioeconomic status effect that accounts for vastly more of the variation than the within nation competition, okay? You will never guess that the actual, if you do not have the first language, the language in which the test is administered, you won't do so well as people who, not rocket science or anything, but these things apply. People from cultural minorities, people from indigenous societies can find in there that there have been comparisons that the PISA people have done. Whereas if you are an indigenous person, you will tend to do less well on these tests. So there are powerful confirmations of the fact that we don't serve certain populations well enough in these studies. They're never, almost never reported. And that's not just in Australia, it's across the whole of the thing. So these, the amount of talent, regardless of your, what you think of the validity of the test, the amount of talent that's gone into the analyses of these data, these reports are worth a look. They're all on the web. They're not bedtime reading. They're all on the web and they are really, elements of them will really challenge the way we think about literacy, will lead us to think about better explanations. Okay, and they're assuming a single dimension. When NAPLAN reports reading, it's reading, right? We all know what reading is, well, yeah. Let me show you another approach to that. Danielle Dennis did a nice study in 2012. I talked about this in other places. She took the usual measures, standardized measures of the usual measures that the National Reading Panel in the United States says we should talk, we should use, and she wanted to look at struggling adolescent read, readers. And we wanted to know, is, is there a dimension called reading? We look at the NAPLAN reports. The first question the statistician asks is, all of these items here, do they actually statistically relate to, uh, say all the reading ones go together, statistically, all the writing ones, there's things, you can bet they don't. But that, that analysis hasn't been done. There may be interesting things to find, like what Daniel Dennis found, but there, in fact, when you look at the statistical structure of these things, there's only three actual reliable factors here, which she called text-level comprehension, word knowledge, and fluency. Fluency's got phonemic awareness and decoding and the fluency measure in the one. Not statistically separable. They don't operate as three things in the actual performance of these kids. She looked at about 100 kids and she said, if I take those three things, text level, word knowledge, and fluency, and then I look at all these struggling readers, right? Do they all have the same kind of profile? Well, no, they don't. They break down, about 100 of them break down into nicely almost equal groups. And the way you read the thing is that there's 23 students across the top, the way I'm fighting to read this screen down here, <laughs> get these things on it. And the first, those top 23 kids are above average on their comprehension. They're kind of slightly below average on their word knowledge and their average and their fluency. That percentage of them there uh, have been labeled as reading or as learning disabled. That percentage, 81, they come from these poverty homes, and that percentage, zero, have non-English speaking backgrounds. So these groups break out into those four clusters. And you can see they're qualitatively different clusters. These are different profiles altogether. That's what cluster analysis does. It breaks people down into families, if you like, who look the same on the profile of the three scores that we are using. So this 
in terms of Daniel Dennis's sample at least, there's four ways of being a struggling reader. And this is what it means when it says if you go in with the silver bullet, that's why this profession, the one thing it says is there's no single silver bullet. It's not just that this thing doesn't work. This thing might work for one of these groups, right? But you actually got to know who they are. You've got to know statistically that the thing reading is not our thing, or that writing is not our thing. It doesn't stand up that way when you look at the ways in which the things that kids are good at. It's a kind of resources type model. What resources do these kids have? Look where the NESB students are. The NESB students' profile is that they're seriously weak at comprehension. They're seriously good at word knowledge. Word knowledge usually relates to cultural knowledge, that they actually know stuff about the world. They know what the words are. And they're kind of, you know, they're a little bit below average in their fluency. It's a completely different profile. You'd want to respond to it in different ways. You use the one thing for these hundred kids, you're getting it wrong for some of them. At least, maybe you're getting it wrong for all of them. But here is a thing that says, you better be aware that when you see reading in the PISA thing or in the NAPLAN thing or wherever you see it, that you actually need to think about the subcomponents of what that might look like and about that that might alert you to some very broad, crude thing. And there's a flag in the ground over here about trust or gender or whatever it is. But that flag just tells you you better go look. It doesn't tell you what to do. It doesn't tell you what the actual finding uh, might be. One of the better studies that does use standardized tests but also is one of the rarer studies, I'm really conscious ah, of my time here, so I'm going to dance pretty fast here, is uh, Judith Langer's study, a five-year longitudinal study. It is almost impossible to get longitudinal funding, funding for seriously longitudinal studies. And yet every question that you might ask about the eff efficacy of your work is not about next week, it's about the years ahead. There is so little data to guide you there. There is so much stuff that says we had a long-term follow-up three weeks later. Yeah, well, I haven't for 40 weeks, you know, that kind of thing. Five-year longitudinal study. She picked a whole bunch of schools demographically from the same kinds of catchment, but some of which were doing really well and some of which were really struggling, and she just wanted to know, here's a natural experiment here. You know, what can I find out about these schools that are doing better? There's the kinds of folks we're talking about. 88 classes. I don't know who the student informants were. You know, it's kind of interesting. Some of them got paid to tell her what she wanted to hear. That's Judith Langer. Okay. What did she find? Well, the, here's what the beat the odds do. Five years of study for this. This is not a PhD. This is three PhDs. Here. You know what? They didn't just use student-centered or teacher-centered or whatever centered instruction. They didn't use a form, they didn't use a particular form of pedagogy, they used a responsive pedagogy, a mixture of approaches, as they saw the kids needing this kind of work. They didn't have Newton universe that says, this is the right kind of teaching, be student-centered. Okay? They had Einstein's universe. Look at the relativities, move back and forth as you need to. Have the kids that can relate to you in a way that they know they need to sit down and be quiet and take this in, as well as they need to come up with this because the lesson needs you to engage and to contribute and to initiate. And that you have a relationship which tolerates and nurtures both of those approaches, both that spectrum of approaches. They were not scared of assessing. They did it regularly, but what they did was they assessed kids in terms, the assessments were integrated, you can see it, into what they do in the curriculum, what they did themselves. They didn't take disembodied decontextualized assessments and see whether what we were doing here and now, day, hands on day in, day out, worked for that. They wanted to know how did you go with this stuff set in the settings that they were doing within the unit goal. And they worked very hard with colleagues. This is an important point that I've never met a teacher who doesn't have a powerful sense of individual responsibility, but what I think is often lacking in the kids' experience is a sense of collective responsibility that these teachers from whom I go to one to the other, whatever the preposition should have been there, whom I visit, you know, for a year at a time or 50 minutes at a time. Now I go to the next one, okay? Continuity, connectedness. They, they work hard on that, these schools. That was one of the main features that I think is important. And they engage students in lots of talk, fewer texts, long, patient, analytic work, talking through what the texts mean, close readings and all that sort of stuff. Fewer texts, which means these texts, better, the ones you pick, better be up to it. Okay, they've got to be rich, demanding enough that you can engage in longer treatment of them. The other schools did the opposite thing. 
as such a one thing. They didn't assess so much or they used decontextualized assessments. They didn't work hard on their cumulative interconnected consistency across these kids whose, whose achievements are, if two are hanging on and struggling, suffer more from transitions than kids who have more robust support systems and have got the skills in, okay? So a rough transition to a new teacher or a new subject area, a new organization is harder for them. Okay, I wanted to, I don't know what happened then. Okay, I wanna talk about now some quick takes and I'm, uh, from, and this I've talked about before so I'll be fast and it's, it's, one, it's one I think, stuff that you know about, but I think it's an imp immensely important study. And I know that the authors of this study are using um, this work and they get invited to talk and it's usually not in Australia. Okay, I'm talking about Fran Christie and Bev Berejanka. I'm talking about the study they did where they compared what kids have to read and be, be good at reading and be good at writing in English science and history from K to 12, basically. And they tried to map it out using genre theory and they looked at the kind of grammatical stuff that was involved, a very detailed study. No, another not for bedtime reading book, but an important study that really bears very heavily on our interest here as English and literacy people. And they drew what they called the general road map. If you look at that there, early childhood, many of you have seen this before, I won't go too quickly through it. Congruent languages where the language sort of sounds like common sense, the man bit the dog, or whatever, the dog bit the man, whoever bit, right? That kind of straightforward subject verb object type of stuff, as opposed to, you know, passive voices or embedded clauses and things like that. With simple attitudinal and bare, which character did you like best in that verb? Okay. Why did you like that character best? Early childhood. And then moving through into middle childhood and early ad adolescence. The language in science, history, and English starts to come away gradually from common sense. It starts to be less congruent. It starts to be more technical, slightly more technical in its own way. Grammatical metaphor appears, which is where a process like the stone hit the window turns into a noun, the impact of the stone on the window. Being technical and being Germanic, English is a noun-centered language and it means in academic work that you can say more about that noun and move it around as a whole thing, even though it's a complicated process or in the case of a metaphor like the water cycle, it's a, you know, it's a series of processes and activities that get turned into nouns, the Renaissance. Academic work is based on large, heavy duty usages of nominalization. And that's when it appears and it gets more intensive and the language and knowledge becomes less commonsensical, expanded attitudinal. If you're still saying, you know, the teacher's not asking you which, which character you like best in Juli Romeo and Juliet or in the novel. It shouldn't be, you know. I like her because, you know, she gets more talk or something like that. It's not gonna work. And finally, we get that, the uncommon sense of senior, at late adolescence to senior years. The narrative goes something like this. When you look specifically at English history and science, you find a narrative that, that wants to say, these disciplines, these curriculum domains, put this thing literacy to work in their own image and likeness, and that process starts in upper primary. Which is why year seven and eight are hard for kids because the secondary teachers tend to expect some already some, ex some developments that are more curriculum specific. The writing expectations across year five to year eight are dramatic, okay, and they found that. And they found that between bullet point two and bullet point three, large numbers of kids fall off the program, okay? This is a 13 year program, okay? Do we have data about that? Well, apart from this and one or two other studies, do we have longitudinal studies, ethnographic studies or uh, cognitive science studies about this 13 year program? No, not particularly. We've got little studies that do a three or four week follow up here and there, right? Little strategy based studies and so on. The program itself has been mapped out for us by applied linguistics. The actual data on what kinds of stories there are within it, what the medical profession can draw on before it gets to its randomized field controls is long epidemiological studies and hundreds and hundreds of case studies developed and documented by practitioners and research centers. The little golden, you know, sta gold standard experiments is just the tip on this long iceberg. The ideas that find their way through come from this large compilation of studies like this, but there's nothing comparable like this with regard to classroom life, with regard to the development of capabilities that allow us to do that. That's a real hole in our research base and it's 
very difficult to get funding. I just included here so you look at how they map out the general map for history and you can see certain kinds of things across the top. You've got the uh, phases of, of the year levels and the kinds of things that they do at different phases. This is the ideal map so that by the time they get to late secondary, they're doing exposition and discussion, but they're also using histori historiography. They're also studying how it is that history gets made. They're studying the writing of history, not just telling the stories anymore. Okay, if you're still arguing, you're not going to get asked which character in the Peloponnesian War did you like best. It's not going to happen. And, you know, English teachers here, how many of your kids in year 9, 10, 11 just tell you the story of the novel and you write, you're supposed to just not tell me the story of the novel and they are thinking this worked pretty well in year 4. How come it's not working now? It's because the discipline has taken hold of this technology literacy and you are expected to be on that program. That's what we expect. That's what we want you to be good at. So that's a powerful narrative and a really important empirical study that I think there should be a copy of this book and it is in every school. I want to tell you now about another person you've never heard of. Uh, and there are very few, relatively few, genuine sociological studies of literacy at literacy education in schools. There's a nice study by Stanton Worthing in a book called Identity and Curriculum that uh, is an interesting read. It's more readable because it's ethnographic, tells the story how kids actually develop their identities in classrooms vis-a-vis -vis their the, the, the powerful, successful or otherwise engagement with the curriculum. It's not that their identity develops like this and they're being like this because of this stuff and then their engagement with the curriculum is like this. But for kids, this is the life and workspace in which they work on and develop their identity. But this one's different. This is done by uh, a, an American political scientist working in the sociology fac uh, faculty. An old study. If you, what does a political scientist using sociological methods have to say about the teaching of reading? And she uses the concept of the mobilization of bias. These are US schools. She's interested in success and failure, power and authority, and how these things work. Political scientists are interested in power. Sociologists are interested in how it is that social order is maintained. There's seven billion of us plus. How is it that we get through the day? How, do we, how, do we, how does orderliness, you know, what gets on the news is where orderliness breaks down. But the other seven billion, the rest of the seven billion people, somehow we got through. Sociologists want to know what are the structures, the ways in which people behave and take themselves to be doing different things. And I'll read you what she says. Mobilization of bias is in how we define, explain, and try to solve the problem of literacy learning by reference to the students' backgrounds. This is what she found in the school. The issue of teaching, reading, understanding it, defining what is counted as, and trying to solve it, refers, is, is done, that work is done collectively by the teachers she studied by reference to the student's background. These ways of talking frame and justify the content of the lessons and the tests and the organization of the school's practices. Central to this bias mobilization is discourse about parents' involvement in support programs. I can warn you, sociologists, if you've got a parent involvement program going, and you probably should have, but you won't like what the sociologists say about that. Dorothy Smith said that's the quickest way to intensify differences in outcomes to bring the parents involved, to keep shifting that explanation back into the parents' brain. Pratt says this, parent involvement, I quote, parent involvement in schooling is far more important for the support it offers the school's mobilization of bias than it is for improving the achievement of disadvantaged students. Top that. Because teachers with high, both high and low levels of contact with and, interested in, and interest in the parents and home life still control the definition and the meaning of the kids' attributes as they are shown in the classroom. As the kid comes to be, in my interview with parents showed this, that the parents, this is a long, 20 years ago I did study and looking at parents, how parents construe their, their contact with schools and they define the kid, their kid in, term, in the terms that uh, relate to the school's definitions of successful learning, successful reading and writing and so on. And Fratz wants to say, you have to think about, this is what sociologists will say to us, you have to think about seeing literacy education as a real touchstone of how public organizations start to relate to very little people from very different backgrounds, different socioeconomic backgrounds and different cultural settings. Literacy is a real flashpoint for that and in schools, the organization of schools, the definition of their abilities in those regards 
gets to be a vital aspect of how it is we, that these kids begin to learn who they are and where they are, where they belong, if you like, and how the organizations will, public organizations will relate to them. So this is a very strong sort of message with regard to that. Have you found that? Oh, I've read that already. Yes, no. Next, the schools were full of talk about literacy negligent parents. And I read a quote from Mrs. Sarah Michaels on Friday where she complained about this, basically just lost it completely in print and said, enough of this pseudo-science, damaging, pernicious nonsense from researchers who should know better. So she probably lost some friends that day. But very experienced and usually very dignified sociologist. Okay. So that's how a sociologist sees one sociologist with a background in political science sees that. That's a, diff that's, a, that's a research finding you don't hear much about, yeah? Less often told narrative about what schools do. What does it say to us? It says, change the ways, rethink the ways we define, explain, and try to solve the issue of literacy education. Be very aware that if you've grown up successful enough to be a school teacher in, a, in an Australian school, you were brought up believing things about social class, about poverty, and about cultural background and difference. You can't avoid that. It's how we were socialized. We function like this because we know how these categories work. You give us a profile of kids, we can talk as though we know the kid. How can that possibly be? It's called being socialized into this society. And we are, we're good at it. We're, we're teachers, we're educators. Well, is this useful? Well, at least is it a, it's a counterweight to the sociologically blind kind of literacy narratives that we get sometimes from applied linguistics or from uh, cognitive science or from experimental science and so on, for tests and tests and measurement where these things, these social categories don't exist. The idea that it all originates in the individual psychological states of learners or in their parents. And study from ACR many years in 1989 concluded with, of course, they found, of course, which this study has, a strong correlation between socioeconomic status and literacy performance. And their, their conclusion was that, obviously, the cultural levels in some homes are different from others. And the statistical probability that all of those homes are next to other people with the same levels in the same clustered into these suburbs starts to become infinitesimally small unless you start thinking sociologically. Okay. I want to talk about historians now. How are we going? I'm out of nearly out of time. Okay, I'm nearly out of time. Right, good. I'll run through this very quickly. Hist historians give you a different story, but there is a common thread coming through here. This lady, Rosalind Thomas, has written a lot about ancient Persia, Greece, and Rome, and she says, and I follow, there is a fascinating tension between the obvious fact that writing makes some activities possible or easier, and that different potentials are seized upon by different communities. In some, she concludes, Writing means bureaucracy, control, and oppression by the state. This is a historian talking about hundreds and hundreds of years since the development of literacy. And in others, I quote, it's an enabling skill that frees an individual's creative potential. Does that conflict ring a bell in the current scheme anywhere? Okay, obedience, compliance, getting it right, training for school, training for job, job ready, versus another thing. Literacy can do both of these things powerfully. Talk about hundreds of years. And Elizabeth Eifenstein's written this magnificent two volume historical study of the printing press and its effect on European society. And she says this We seem to be still experiencing, 500 years after Gutenberg, the contradictory effects of a process which fanned the flames of religious zeal and bigotry, while at the same time fostering a new concern for ecumenical concord and tolerance which fixed linguistic and national divisions more permanently, while at the same time creating a cosmopolitan commonwealth of learning and knowledge. These are long lessons from history that we're still in the middle of these issues. Is it mainly for this? Is it mainly for that? We talk as though it's intrinsically this or intrinsically that. We want to say literacy is this, literacy is that. Literacy does all of these things. What literacy does is accelerate and intensify and broaden the reach of a whole range of processes that are political and social and individual and psychological and so on. And finally, Harvey Graff, whom I've all read to before. But if you look historically, more recently, in the last 200 years, and why it is that schools, governments have supported literacy education 
they have decided that on balance an illiterate society is potentially more damaging than a, than a literate society as long as, and, he qu and I quote, as long as that literacy is engaged in under supervision and instruction. And quote, mass literacy requires social and individual control. Again, ring a bell. Okay, we're in the midst of this still as the ancient Greeks and Persians were doing these different things as well. So we have to rethink this thing in this in literacy studies and research. Very many studies that talk about the intensification of ongoing processes. I won't go through those. But we are in the midst of a current deep and fast period of transformation. It's, it's been documented in other places. A couple of presentations yesterday, Lisa Pillen's study, on, um, I thought showed very well that this isn't going to look the way it looks now in the next generation. There are real issues about that. And you can go and go. And finally, uh, John, well, finally, not quite finally, John Walensky's brilliant paper on the critical, why it is that the critical. Part of, part of the issue of the phenomenal potential uh, standardizing effects of literacy education, an antidote to that, uh, according to Walensky, and according to all of us that have been involved many years in critical literacy, he says the following, it's important to continue to create an educational space within critical literacy for the culture of critique, a space to work out critiques that can seize hold of the most basic contradictions, broken promises, seeming conundrums and necessary compromises. It's important in that sense to treat critique as the supremely educational event that fosters autonomy and reflection. Historians do this best because they've got to compare different accounts of different things. They've got to realize that these words aren't carrying the meaning somehow magically with them, that this is a matter of critiquing what goes on. There's John. So these, what do these suggest? Well, there's nothing good in itself about having more of this thing called literacy. We just want to think about it quantitatively, having more in terms of these contrasting effects, this fantastic capacity of literacy to accelerate processes of oppression and personally, and communally and socially and so on, as well as enabling creativity and so on. And so the question looks like this, it seems to me, it's the same question. I gave my first keynote address to ALIA 30 years ago, almost to the day, in 1985 in the Sheraton at Brisbane, and I made a similar point. Isn't it curious that we're making the same point, it may be just me, but I don't think it's just me. I think it's that these are some of the abiding things. It's about what kinds of capabilities you want to work on here, what kind of way of engaging this literacy, of working with reading and of working with kids' writing and production. It's actually the qualities that we want to teach in different ways that count here. And they seem to have shut my little, whoops. There's some pictures of children, and some of them are my grandchildren. So what kinds of research? And some of these are my grandchildren, too. We, we have the very little one on a, um, a remedial program of not eating mobile phones, it seems. <laughs> and it's not working. OK. I want to talk very briefly, and then I'll, uh, um, and I'll make a time here, about some research that I've been looking at, some methodological issues that I've been working at, coming out of the work of Ray Pawson and what's called realistic evaluation. It's not a particularly uh, nifty name. But Pawson wants to say, you know what? In a lot of educational research, we treat it as though it's a medical lab experiment, okay? What we should be looking at is the analogies to big social programs that have actually worked, like anti-smoking campaigns. And what the anti-smoking researchers want to say is that you've got to look at the ways, and in the third bullet point there, these things work in this context, and the triggers for these things working or not working seems to be these things. And when those triggers are in operation over a long period of time, you get these longer outcomes. Just looking at the realities of difference, imagining that in fact there are different ways of being a struggling reader in year three as in year nine, as in adulthood, okay? and that it is the qualities involved in that that we need to understand, and that not every smoker will be encouraged to stop smoking by the same kind of campaign because they live in different kinds of contexts. That's what research needs to be. It needs to be sensitive to what the contexts are and what the triggers are that work in certain contexts and not in others. 
So Pawson wants to say educators have kind of got the wrong analogy that they're thinking about. It's like it's medical research and we can measure it and do this and you do a little experiment for three weeks and you can tell teachers as uh, uh, as well as recent research has said not to use pictures in early, in early reading books because it distracts the kids and it takes them a little longer to learn the letters. There were 24 kids in that study. There were five minutes a week for three weeks and the fourth week was a test. Okay. Statistically significant. Anyway. And fi just this is the end. <laughs> One of the things to remember, just amidst a, a lot of the talk at the conference today uh, and yesterday has been uh, about the political conditions that we're in. It's partly because of what that's on the news and all the rest of it, partly because there are strong movements uh, around education and around literacy education, changing the English curriculum and so on. Joe said this best. There is an important sense in which we have to realise that politicians and senior bureaucrats and journalists do what they do for a living. Right? And what we do is, is the other thing, is the object sometimes of what they want to talk about. And we should be prepared to help them if they wish to be helped in that regard. But we should not let this break our stride because this is a very long stride. There's a brilliant book by Fisher on the history of writing. This is bedtime reading. You would love to. And from 4,000 years ago, one of the reasons we have some of these things is because clay dries in the sun and it lasts longer than papyrus and all these other things. So we actually know more about ancient Sumerian writing from 4,000 years ago than we do about more recent things. There's tablets in the desert. Most of these tablets that they find in the desert are, you know, you now owe your ruler three goats and, you know, they're administrative things, tax things, or just the announcement of a new wonderful ruler who's, you know, king of everything and the great, you know, all that sort of stuff. And they're basically administrative, you know, shopping lists and stuff like that. But this one they found 4,000 years ago. And this one is a really interesting one for us. It says that. This is a thank you letter from a parent to a teacher. 4,000 years ago, one of your colleagues taught this little boy how to write. There weren't many people that learned. And look at what the parent said. This is a careful choice of words. My son was willing to learn, and you allowed wisdom, skill, knowledge, disposition, reflection, discernment, wisdom. You didn't teach him to be wise, but you gave him the means that allowed that to happen. And that's how you did it. You taught him to write. You taught him to, that he could externalize his thoughts and feelings on this tablet. 4,000 years ago, this person was telling us what we do for a living. Don't forget this. The politicians and the journalists and the bureaucrats do what they do for a living, and they may need our help or they may want our help or they may not. But we constantly need to re-energize our ideals around English and literacy education in this sort of environment. And we constantly need to remember that this is what we do for a living. Thank you. Peter, thank you so much. Um, for 30 years, you've been challenging us. You've been sharing your amazing knowledge of the research with us. And you've been encouraging us to ask why but to not forget the importance of what we do. Thank you so much.